Uh, as this, so thank you all for coming, everyone. Um, as this has now become a joint Cath Sock Phil Sock event, I'll be so bold as to at least for my benefit start with a prayer. So, Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, e benedictus fructus ventris tu, Iesus. Santa Maria Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. So, I can now sort of metaphorically take my dog collar off. That was kind of the deal. Um, so, just a bit of background. So, I'm Father Peter, I'm the Catholic chaplain here. And when I'm not um, around here or doing some other things, I'm working on a PhD part-time at the University of Durham looking at how Catholic theology can respond to long-termism. And so what we're going to do is take that sort of Catholic theology bit to one side for a moment and just look at long-termism itself. And I guess just as a sort of briefing, um, you might start to get the sense that I'm sort of artificially creating this sense because it sort of makes sense with the content. You know, so, I, so what I've done is I've studied long-termism, set it up with some nice tidy questions that sort of Catholic theology can then answer. And that's in many ways where we're, that's the point we're going towards. You know, what are the questions that are left when we've thought about these things a little bit? Um, and I guess all I can do is reassure you that that isn't like an artifice of my method. That's genuinely there in the literature. Um, there are some really big questions that are left unanswered. So the great Rawls in his social ethics says that future ethics puts every moral theory to almost unsurmountable challenges. Um, there are big questions that are unresolved about future ethics, and we see this play out, and you'll see this in some of the things we talk about. You know, just big social questions. It's one of the big conversations of our time to try to look at how we respond to these questions. And there has been a bit of a shift from maybe in the last five years, just quite an uncritical reception of some of this material, to actually starting to ask about, okay, well, actually, maybe things are a bit more difficult than we first thought. So, so that's why um, that's what you know, things are set up in that way, very much leading to some questions. A, hopefully that you know that might lead to some debate after the talk. You know, you might have a bit of a thing. You might have a view um, on what sort of the response to these questions might be, and it'd be really interesting to hear what they are. Um, but also, that does reflect the reality. You know, there are some very serious people. There's a reason why Oxford has a Future of Humanity Institute, and there are some very clever people there who don't know the answers to these questions. Cambridge has the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. There's some even cleverer people there, if I dare say that, um, working very hard to try to answer these questions, and they're not really sure what the answers are yet. So, yeah, so it's not artificial that this presentation ends with some questions. The only other little point, if I address you to the top left, on Wednesday when I was preparing this, um, just to show you, in case um, it might be your first experience or an early experience of just how powerful AI is becoming, it took me approximately 35 seconds to produce the artwork that's um, appearing in this presentation, just using Midjourney AI on some rough prompts around what the future of doing philosophy might look like. Um, I think they're quite nice. Um, but yeah, literally it was less than a minute to just generate all of these. Um, I think that gets me going. So yeah, long-termism essentially comes down to two fundamental sort of realizations that are new. Is that gonna work? Um, there we go. And the first one of those is that we are now the greatest danger to ourselves. There was a very definitive moment that was passed in the 20th century, where up to that point, the greatest risk faced by humanity was, would have been the natural existential risks. Um, you know, so an asteroid or a supervolcano going off. There's some really weird ones. Um, you could have a quantum phase shift occurring somewhere in a galaxy a million miles away. Um, and that would just reset the laws of physics and we all just disappear instantaneously. It's, there's some really weird possibilities that could come out. Um, there's, so there's these natural risks, but this threshold was crossed. Yes, with the invention of the atomic bomb. Go see Oppenheimer, because it addresses this really well. Um, so this is a really important quote from Bertrand Russell. He was speaking in the House of Lords just shortly after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I'll just read it out because it's so important. So, we do not want to look at this thing simply from the point of view of the next few years. So he's commenting on this invention. We want to look at it from the point of view of the future of mankind. Is it possible for a scientific society to continue to exist or much such a society inevitably bring itself to destruction? So there's this really visceral image, I'll skip it now, of 
you know, walking around the streets of London and realizing that we very much now have the potential to just flatten it. You know, he sees, I see St. Paul's, I see the great monuments and streets covered with bodies. And he was one of the only people that early to pick up that it wasn't just a question of, oh, we've invented atomic bombs now. A really big moment had happened because for the first time, humanity developed the technology with which to annihilate itself. And that's a huge step forward. Just a threat, you know, it's a change of degree rather than of kind there. And since then, we've discovered lots of other ways to destroy ourselves. So engineered pandemics. The interesting point to make is that since I've started working on this, all of these just have a little bit more strong a resonance because nuclear defensive postures have absolutely shifted in the last five years. And that's all I'll say on that. We've all experienced the pandemic recently. Yes, a natural one, but there are vials of viruses more contagious and more deadly than COVID in labs in America and at least in China, probably also in Russia. Um, just to raise the issue of this, Al-Qaeda has in the past sent students to Oxford to study, study biomechanical engineering in the hopes of equipping themselves with the ability to develop a virus that with which could cause terrorist levels of damage. So engineered pandemics are there. The big one that's become a really hot topic over the last two years, un unaligned artificial intelligence. Um, I was at Bletchley um, at the recent conference, not at the thing itself. I didn't get an invite to hang out with Elon Musk, but there was a day of events before that for people that were interested in these things. Um, so it was really interesting to get an update there. Most experts say it might be, let's say between 50 to 30 years now. The estimated time left until we get an artificial intelligence with a general capacity that would exceed a human one, that the expert's estimate just keeps getting shorter and shorter and eventually that will converge. Um, but we're yeah, talking in our lifetimes, realistically, one of the most important milestones in technology ever to be crossed. That will happen and we need to be prepared for it. And then catastrophic climate change. The jury's out a little bit about whether or not climate change actually counts as an existential risk for it to be so bad that we actually annihilate ourselves and for it to be, strictly speaking, an existential catastrophe. You know, it's, it's the real extremes of what could happen. But if you really go into things, you realize that it might be that we get so focused on fixing climate change or climate change causes us to be so occupied with just basic survival that one of the other risks then plays out. So, and this is one of the big ways that things have developed um, because we start to just talk more generally in sense of a category of anthropogenic existential risks. And that has huge advantage epistemologically because if you still think, and this is a trap that we still fall into, a lot of people haven't made that step yet to realize that our response to climate change, our response to pandemics, to nuclear war, to AI, have deeply common threats, but we're, as a society, still mentally fixated on fixing one of them. And we don't see them as a sort of shared problem. And the problem is, if we're only responding to one or two at a time, we can become so fixated on one thing that actually the biggest problem might come out somewhere else. So for a long time, people were saying, you know, we need to stop worrying so much about climate change, but we need to talk about AI because that's potentially the biggest problem. And that's why a lot of people are relieved that AI has become such a hot topic. But the question might still be posed, well, what about some of the other ones? Because we might be so focused and you know, so proud of ourselves that we're doing so much to address climate change and artificial intelligence that actually some of our regulation of biomechanical research might start to lapse or we just will be insufficient. And then actually one of those existential risks plays out. And the thing with existential risks is we don't get a second chance, just de facto. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we underestimate them is because our perception of the risk of tragedy is proportional to how many times it's already happened. But the thing is with existential risks, you only get one go. So that's an important point. So Toby Ord, who's one of the great researchers at the FHI in Oxford, um, he crunched some numbers and has one in six chance if we do nothing of the human race being extinct in this century. Other experts put it more at like 20% and maybe 45 to 50% of a massive catastrophe um, but these risks are real, and they're more real than a lot of people tend to realize. Um, so that's kind of like the, the pu public service announcement, the PSI. Um, the second realization that 
really feeds into long-termism is just how long the future of humanity might actually be. So, the obvious sort of comparison is, okay, well, the average mammal species lives for around a million years. So we could try and use that as a benchmark. Okay, well, let's say humanity lives for a million years, in which case we are still very much in the early history of humanity. Let's say you know, the clock started counting 100,000 years ago, and we're still very much in the early days. And then, of course, we're not the average mammal. We can protect ourselves. We can intervene um, with what's happening. If you imagine in 50, you know, let's say we live for another 20 million years time and some natural disaster is happening. Chances are by that stage, we'll have the technology to resolve that issue if we already don't. So we might then ask, okay, well, what's the planetary time scale? Um, so the sun in a billion years, more or less, will expand to the point where life on Earth becomes impossible. So if, if we're saying that the upper limit of human life is the planetary situation, then we've got a billion years. Considering the rate of development of technology over the last 50 years, it's not unthinkable that, let's say, in 500 million years' time, we might have the capacity to leave the planet, which then puts us on a galactic time scale. In 5 billion years, the Milky Way and Andromeda will clash together. And actually, a lot of people say, well, actually, because galaxies are so sort of sparsely populated, because they're so um, empty, they're mostly space, actually galaxies can collide and just pass through one another in an odd way. So it might not actually necessarily mean the end of humanity. But, you know, let's say, you know, humanity was to live for a billion years. There are trillions and trillions of people that will follow us. And the idea that what we do now might affect the lives of those people or potentially give, never give them the chance to be, should weigh a little bit. At least it's a, it's a non-trivial moral question to look at that. So we have this general principle then of, there's something called the total view theory. And so this is very utilitarian. Um, if you start taking that idea of you wanna in some sense aggregate sort of the future value of humanity that may or may not come, then it's potentially absolutely enormous. Um, just to summarize for you guys, two points that have essentially been made so far. Um, we, for the first time in ever, we have the power to wipe ourselves out. Nuclear bombs, engineered pandemics, AI, possibly climate change. And then what I'm talking about now is humanity could live for a very long time. So again, going back to the lower estimate, let's say we just live for the same amount of time as the average mammal species, there's a million years, then we are really very much the beginnings of human history. So that sense of, okay, what if we were to pull together the possible value axiologically of what's to come, then that has a huge moral implication for us. And then the thing is, we don't know how good the future's gonna get, right? So Toby Ord does this really beautifully in his book called The Precipice. He has this whole idea that if you look at human history as sort of like a journey climbing up a mountain, we're at this point where we're walking along a precipice and it's very possible that we could fall off and the journey's over. But if we get through it and reach what he calls existential security, then this whole rich and very beautiful potential future, then we could keep on climbing that mountain. So it's a very particular point of human history that we're in right now. Because if we get this right, if we learn how to protect ourselves from the risks that we cause ourselves, then the future could be amazing. But if we don't, then we'll just die. Um, so that, that's sort of Toby's um, premise. And the point he makes is that, yeah, we don't know how good future value would be. So he does this thought experiment. So, and all of you now just think for them, if there's not one standalone moment, but a moment where your life was full of richness and meaning. For me, that'd be the day I was ordained a priest. That just everything just fell in place. There was a richness to what I was doing. They were so uplifting. People with children will talk about, there'll be just some moment, you know, an encounter with their child, seeing them run towards them, where just everything just sort of fell together. And there's those sort of peak moments of human life and human experience. Sort of the general mold will be, well, possibly then with time, because we spend so much of our time and energy just kind of trying to survive, as we work forward in the future, we can spend more and more time amongst those peaks. We can spend more and more time amongst that richness. So it's not even, okay, well, in the future, we're talking about lives that 
um, will really you know, be like the best version of our lives now, like really, really good lives now. We're actually talking about lives that could be so filled with spending that time in those peak moments of human richness. And given time, they could develop value, categories of value that, that are unknown to us. You know, the analogy is, you know, there are music, there's music that we are not attuned to hearing yet. You know, there are things that we can imagine that we enjoy now. You know, let's say the social benefits of a global connectivity that just would have been unthinkable 100 years ago. You know, the fact that I'm still in regular contact with my godson in Los Angeles. And that gives my life a richness that's difficult to think, that would have been difficult to conceive. You know, we'll invent new forms of play, of music, of culture, of artistic expression. So there's this whole potential future that we have to allow for the possibility that the future will have richness that is difficult for us to imagine right now. So all the more then, this sort of you know, flowering future really could be quite blissful um, in a way that's difficult for us to appreciate. The other side of that coin is that, oh, this work? we don't know how bad things will get. So, um, actually, the, the, you'll forgive a slightly gimmicky slide, but um, it's, it's what mid-journey threw up. Um, so, we have to be open to the possibility that once we start thinking about this category of anthropogenic existential risks, you can start making some new comments. So the rate at which we discover ways to destroy ourselves is increasing. So it'd be incredibly naive to think that we found them all. Actually, realistically, as you know, the trend seems to be, that the more we go into the future, we're gonna keep discovering new ways to destroy ourselves. So again, this is sort of like, like the uncertainty played out on the other side of the coin. So we'll discover them probably faster and faster as technology develops. At least one of them will be more hazardous than the existential risks we have now. And the thing is, they could be a lot easier to enact. So one of the problems with AI is that, with regulating it at least, is that whilst with nuclear weaponry, you know, it's not sort of up to sort of an individual's agency to you know, develop a nuclear bomb. You, know, you need the resources of a state to do that. AI is a bit trickier because actually we're almost at the stage where someone sat at home with a laptop, you know, as long as they have enough graphics cards, um, could be the one to discover. It's a bit unlikely. It's more likely to be one of the big organizations. But already it's an organization with maybe a few people at the head rather than an actual state. We're almost at the point of biomechanical me uh, research where a skilled biomechanical engineer could construct a virus that's a species killer. And then he just needs to have a bad afternoon and just have enough of humanity to let that go. So there's this sort of reduction of the number of agents required for a catastrophe to play out. And so we're not quite at the stage of, um, you know, having someone being able to produce something as destructive as a nuclear bomb in their own kitchen. But if we got to the stage, if we developed a technology where the average person could develop something that destructive. And we obviously we don't know what it is, that's the point. But then the existential insecurity that comes from that is quite terrifying. Um, so have a thought of that. The other thing to talk about is that we could lock in, that's kind of the term, the future into a really bad state. So let's say climate change really plays out. Um, and then there's like a huge nuclear war and you know humanity isn't sort of completely wiped out, but we more or less have to go back to you know, square one in terms of rebuilding society because we are fighting over fresh water, let's say, and you know, World War VI blew up and you know, almost everyone died. We were down to 1% of the population and they have to start again. Well, some people would argue that we've already used up all of the easily available resources so that it would be impossible for that society to restore to where we are now because they'd need to dig that little bit deeper to find the iron they need. They'd need to dig that little bit deeper to find the uranium they need, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all sorts of lock-ins. If you're really interested in this, Bostrom's um, article um, on existential risk, is really, he, he really pulls the thread at what are the weirdest and wackiest things you can think of, and some of the lock-ins there. Um, so there's obviously cultural var varieties of lock-in as well. And this is where the question of value starts to come up, because what's a lock-in for some people would actually be bliss for others. You know, I'm a Catholic priest. You know, a future where sort of the whole world converts to Catholicism, for me is, you know, that's, that's a little taste of the kingdom of heaven. 
For others, that's an absolute tragedy. So immediately then, you're starting to see the difficulties here of, okay, well, what values are in play in terms of how we evaluate the future? And there are no easy resolutions to those uh, problems. So we can kind of reach this initial conclusion um, that is on the general form, we underappreciate both future potential and the risk we cause to it. So it's probably not morally deplorable to act to mitigate those. And most people kind of intuit that that's true. But the problem is some people don't. And in fact, what if I just don't care about future generations? You know, surely I'm justified in prioritizing what I need now and my needs and my flourishing now, rather than worrying about uh, humanity in 10,000 years time, 10 million years time, that might never even actually even exist. And the thing is, though, if we go back to our two fellows that I find quite charming, um, there are always costs to mitigating risks. Right, nuclear weapons. There are people who absolutely lament the regulation of nuclear technology. You know, some people see it, you know, it would have been the silver bullet that would have solved climate change. But because we were so worried about the implications, it was so heavily regulated. I have recently heard that for every kilogram of radioactive material in a nuclear plant in the US, there's a proportionally seven kilograms of paperwork. Um, so the regulation is high. And some people say it killed off the nuclear industry and has deprived us of you know, this one solution. If you're a, you know, not quite a G7 state, and you want to earn yourself a seat at the political table, um, you know, you, you, you know, you're not really actually that fussed about the future of humanity. If you want to really assure the security and a voice geopolitically for your country that developing nuclear weapons offers you, then you know, making the sacrifice of possibly making that step forward for some speculative hope that things are going to you know, be safer in some sense later. That's actually, that's a very material sacrifice to make. With pandemics, it's a little bit less obvious with pandemics, but we are essentially talking about regulating biomechanical research. Um, and you know, the thing about developing viruses is that you understand them better, so you could potentially cure some stuff that we can't cure at the moment. So we're talking about delaying, very concretely, curing people of illnesses for the purposes of existential security, which some people don't want to do. With AI, you know, it's become you know, a little bit of wisdom from the Catholic tradition. If anything ever presents itself as the silver bullet that's going to fix everything, it's not. AI's kind of becoming that. Oh, well, if we have AI, we can just diagnose cancers all the time, long before they're even a problem. We can just solve them straight away. AI's our problem to immigration. AI's our, sorry, our solution to immigration. AI's our solution to X, Y, Z. AI's our solution to writing university essays. Um, and people are saying, well, no, you know, we did it with genetically modified crops. We've done it with nuclear intelligence. Um, let's not deprive ourselves again of the benefits of this technology. You know, this came up at Bletchley um, when I was there. People saying, no, let's not be so paranoid. You know, we're denying ourselves the benefits that AI can generate because some people are worried about it. And then with climate change, again, you know, if, if you're a developing country, and the regulations required for shipping, um, which will really affect your imports and exports that you really need to just push you over the threshold into economic growth. And you don't want to do those regulations because you, or you want the poss cheapest possible shipping so that you can do that. You're realistically, just on a human level, you know, politicians are going to find it very difficult to put forward those kind of proposals because what people really care about is, okay, well, what's my economic growth like? So as you can see, there's always these costs. Um, and there is then the moral problem of trying to justify this. And what I'm going to very quickly in three slides do is just try to give you the impression that, hopefully with some success, every major moral philosophical school struggles to explain why we actually ought to care about future generations. So we'll start sort of deontologically, right? we can kind of assume that future people have some kind of rights to which we have correlative duties. You know, the rights of you know, the future humanity to drinking water. But they're not real, they don't exist. They've never existed, they might not exist. So the, their rights are very speculative at best. Um, the best paper out there at the moment, which is constantly referred to as by an Oxford philosopher, Annette Bayer, called The Rights of Future Persons, 
she concludes, which is really interesting, that there is, um, that ultimately she knows of no moral principle that will completely justify the rights of future generations and that you always eventually end up relying on some kind of dogmatic intuitions. Um, but she does her best case. You know, she, you know, it's the best we've got in terms of justifying the idea that future people have rights, but even she's inconclusive. And there are a lot of people that just don't accept it. They just think she's wrong. Because how can future people have rights when they're not real, when they're not there? Um, if you're a utilitarian, you're in real trouble. Because if you're strictly applying the principles of maximizing the good, then your logic is just completely paralyzed by how vast the future can be. Um, there's a whole, so this sets up the problem of what's called population ethics. The, the Stanford online encyclopedia is very good on this. It really covers it very well. Uh, and there's a whole set of problems. The really fun ones, it's called the repugnant conclusion. And that's basically a quality over quantity issue. So if you have a choice between two galaxies, one of which is filled with one, or let's say 10 blissfully happy people, and another that's filled with a billion people that are just about surviving, if you aggregate the good, you should pick one over the other, but it's really not clear why. It's the classic issue with utilitarianism that it doesn't differentiate who's enjoying the benefits of your goods. And what, if there's any element of justice of deciding one over the other. Um, and, and this just makes sense. If you really applied strict utilitarian principles to long-termism, um, actually, and, and you know, Bostrom himself, if he was in the room, he would recognize this and he's written papers about this. You know, by, by that logic, we should all just go live in caves and just subsist to the basic possible level so that the future of the long term, you know, trillions of people that will come after us will be better. And that really maximizes the good. Of course, no one actually believes that. But from a utilitarian perspective, justifying why, therefore, we start to put inside constraints gets very difficult. Um, the third option, there aren't that many contractualists out there. But if you are a contractualist, um, how do you... Now, how much do you really want to stake sort of the moral importance of hypothetically imagining sort of future agreements with the future ideal, rational, reasonable person? Um, they might even have completely different sets of values to you. You know, if humanity over the course of the next hundred million years evolves to the stage where it doesn't need to drink water, then, you know, our sort of contractualism now that would at least tie in the need for drinking water suddenly becomes meaningless. So. You know, that's quite a radical example, but we have no reason to assume that what we immediately assume now as valuable is going to persist in future generations. So contractualism has issues too. And then that sort of sets up the broader issues of sort of future axiology, of this sort of potential value in the future. Um, do we actually need to worry about it? Is that actually you know, something that's there? Because there's, you know, these values can change, they are purely speculative. You know, we might be wiped out by a quantum phase shift anyway. Um, so, you know, these, these are the questions that we need to answer. And then the explicit counter argument, um, um, most famously put forward by David Benatar in his book, Better Never to Have Been. Um, right, on the whole, actually human life is suffering. Um, and if we look in the past, there was all sorts of tragedy and pain and suffering and it's naive to think that the future will be anything less than that so it's just morally preferable to let humanity end so these are anti-natalists you know they're not actually saying that we should kill people but it's morally preferable if we just stop having children and just let this generation die out because on the whole human life is more bad than good um, the utilitarians have a field day responding to this because then you have to set the threshold at which you decide a human life is worth living. And that gets very tricky very quickly. Um, so by that view then, th these idea of these catastrophes are only bad in as much as the moral pain and suffering experienced by the people that are alive at the time um, is endured. But there's no sense of there being a tragedy because future potential has been unrealized. Um, and it all comes down to this, no one experiences not being. No one experiences the suffering of not being. And there's some, yeah, there's some tricky calculus out there about um, the aggregation of suffering. Um, C.S. Lewis, funnily enough, argued this. You know, if you have two people and they both experience a headache, no one's experiencing a headache twice as strong. So there are some questions about how does suffering actually add up 
from that point of view. And certainly when it comes to not living, you know, well, no one experiences that. Um, some people would even say no one experiences their own death. So actually, perhaps actually death itself isn't the moral tragedy that we think it is, but only includes the suffering that we might experience to get there. Um, so that sort of sets up then sort of the two big questions, which is, one, is there actually a tragedy if impersonal moral value in the future is left in the realm of possibility? Because then all of your sort of Audian, as we'd call it, logic of, oh, we might have this really blissful future. You know, imagine a galaxy full of blissfully happy human beings. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, yeah, it's, it's a nice idea. But does that actually have value today? How does that value sort of transcend time now, axiologically? That's tricky to actually explain. And then the second one is, how do we differentiate between us now exploiting future generations and then this idea that actually we develop a dictatorship of future generations over the present? There's this idea that in becoming, in perceiving ourselves to be the Robin Hoods of the present, actually we're just setting up a mafia of the future. And so that's this pushback that's starting to develop against the ideas of long-termism, that actually we're starting to over-prioritize the needs of the future over the needs of the present. Um, but then how do you tell the difference? Where do you set that threshold? Where do you set those limits? Um, and there's no clear, obvious answer to that, um, which is why a lot of people are worried about it. Um, but obviously you can see then that, as I was saying earlier, when we have sort of our existential risks that we've created for ourselves, and if you're trying to address them, if it's unclear that it's morally actually important that we do so, we're going to really struggle to you know, share the message that we should. Um, you know, the, um, I would say that the, a lot of the grammar that's out there about climate change, for example, or historically about climate change, has underestimated the fact that people actually care about future generations. And actually just explaining that prior issue, if we can, that future people do matter, or maybe they don't, you know, what's your view? Um, we kind of need to overcome that step first before we start telling people the science about climate change, before we start telling the people what the risks of AI might be. So our efforts to mitigate sort of these catastrophes are seriously undermined if we can't actually support that with just an, an actual sort of generally agreeable um, case for why future generations matter. And that's the status questionis. That's, that's where we are. And yeah, philosophers are debating at no end. You could read Samuel Scheffler has a great book, Why We Should Care About Future Generations. Um, yeah, Emil Torres, that's, that's a recent publication, um, actually really criticizing long-termism for, for making this wrong. A lot of that language about the future, sort of the mafia of the future or the sort of the dictatorship of the future comes, comes from that book. Um, and actually it's getting a bit of pickup because long-termism has become quite popular. You know, Elon Musk has really sort of pinned his flag to that mask. Um, they're starting, you know, it is very much a movement. They are starting to have influence. You know, they go to the UN. It's annoying, I email them to see if I can talk to them. I don't know if I'm in Brussels that week. So it's very frustrating. Um, so they are pushing forward, they're having an impact. And there is now this pushback, okay, actually maybe things have got wrong. So hopefully, at least I've, what I've been able to do is to set up some of the issues that are there, some of the difficulties that need to be faced. Because most people do intuit that humanity's future matters. Um, but the challenge is explaining why. Um, yeah, and I'll end there for now. And I'll leave, I'll leave the questions up just so we can potentially reflect them. But as I see it, the, these are kind of the two sort of big philosophical questions that are outstanding at the moment. Um, and yeah, open to questions. Well, Yes, I absolutely agree. So, you know, so on a sort of PR level almost, you know, if you start talking to people about their grandchildren's grandchildren, that can kind of start to sort of 
set up sort of this emotive response to the idea of, okay, well, actually, you know, that's at least further into the future than most people are habitually thinking about. Um, so that gets you in the right direction. Um, and, and we want to be able to go further than that, ideally. Um, the problem is that there's, there's two issues, one of which is um, there's this seemingly insurmountable abyss between sort of the universality that's demanded of us um, by our sort of ideological moral thinking um, and just that basic small grouped emotional thinking. You know, evolutionally redeveloped as tribes, as nations, the family, that's what we care about. So expanding care out from that small group is really hard and it's essentially the essence of this problem. Um, so, um, yeah, so you can try and stretch, okay, well, how far, how big do you think your family is going to be? But eventually, unless you've got something behind it, that's just going to fade out. Because um, put, put your hand up if you know your grandfather's grandfather's name. Right, so, you know, actually, even four generations away, we are, um, we are disconnected. The, big, the other problem is that we've spent, and this is kind of where I just can't, and I can't help but give it a bit of a Catholic spin, we've just spent the last 50 or 200 years working really hard to rupture a sense of connectivity between generations. Because essentially the principle of an individual liberalism is that I am autonomous of pressures from other generations. Now, fair enough, we're talking in the other direction here, but... Uh, sort, of, it, sort of modern liberalism is based on this idea that we freed ourselves from the chains of um, being bound to our past so that I can now individually here and now um, best fulfill my desires, best fulfill my wishes. Um, and so, Cal Surprise, then trying to build those connections into the future, you've sort of cast away the thing that arguably might, might have actually really helped. And that's not just, that's not something that I've come up with as a Catholic priest studying this. There are, there are plenty of philosophers out there that would say the same thing, that actually we might have shot ourselves in the foot here because we've broken those intergenerational connections, such as they were. Um, oh, you're going to follow up? So, yeah, but I mean, not specifically yeah. this, like, I should care about my great-great-grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like, I, ha I, like, in the moment, for me, I yeah. care about my children. Yeah. And then I can assume that my children will care about their children, and then so on. So it's like, yeah. if my grandchildren kind of die, it's going to affect someone that... That I care my about. My grandchildren die, it affects, even if it happens after me, it affects kind of my children. Yeah. So I have it, I'm like, oh, I don't want my grandchildren to die 20 years yeah. after I die because it'll be all my yeah. children. Yeah. You can kind of maybe, I yeah. know, like maybe expand it that way. Yeah. So you have like an immediate care for people mm -hmm. who are alive now who will yeah. have future cares. But, yeah. but I, I guess just, you know, you're, you're sort of trying to do the same thing with just, uh, with just a slightly different framework. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the regression is still going to start to play out. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know I cared about what my grandfather was called. My grandfather cared about what his grandfather was called. But that connection hasn't passed on. Um, there does come a point at which sort of, um, uh, sort of trying to sort of build these chains of emotion just start to weaken the further and further you get away. And, you know, the idea, because you could try to say to someone, okay, well, you know, really, you know, the formulation would be long, you know, if you want to set up sort of your descendants, you know, in 10,000 years time. Um, you know, they're going to care about someone that you're going to care about someone that you're going to care about someone you're going to care about someone. Um, I'd be here for hours to actually express that. Like, it just becomes meaningless. Um, you know, those sorts of lengthy causal chains um, become, again, because you're alienating yourself from the vicinity of um, what's actually emotionally valuable to you, which is really your close family. Um, so that's, that's the challenge. Um, um, and we see that, you know, it's not just a question of between generations. Um, you know, globally, we have this idea of trying to think of ourselves as one big human family. But when it comes to it, actually, sort of, you know, the nation even, that's, that's a level where it seems to be operable, you know, as a, a nation can come together with a sense of national identity. Um, but the moment you try to go further than that, it gets really tricky. And you have sort of the super nations like the US or Russia, um, where you can kind of sort of create, you know, obviously Americans are incredibly patriotic people. Um, but the tensions underneath it are there, the, you know, the... The cultural differences, if you're from Texas or from New York or from San Francisco, you know, having a sense of unity meaningfully between them and some of the local tensions that can then play out are there. So, you know, it's this, there's all sorts of issues where trying to stretch out, you know, what's the group of people that's meaningful to me? Um, um, with, it's, it's just very difficult to explain other than, okay, well, 
I'm going to naturally respond to, because there is something natural about this. We humanly respond to what's close to us. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, this is a no. Apologies if you can't yeah. But how many problems are there that actually um, will only affect people like, uh, like in you know, 10,000 years? Yeah. Kind of, it seems like I think most of the problems that you're going to do long term planning are probably going to be within like 100 years yeah. or something, where you can yeah. maybe have yeah. more of a personal thing. Yeah. Like I can't think of many problems where it's yeah. like. Well, well, the, well, the bit, yeah. Yeah. Well, well the, the big thing we can do is wipe out humanity and then sort of, so all, and that's sort of where the question of future potential comes in um, because that in some sense affects everyone that could have been after us. Um, and that's kind of essentially gets to the reason why, well, actually maybe that's not so much of a problem. Um, uh, that most people think, okay, well actually, we don't want to say that it doesn't matter, that it makes no difference whether or not the future of humanity is the next week um, when Vladimir Putin has a really bad day um, and, and sets us all off. Um, or if humanity will end in, you know, in 100 million years time and we sort all this out and we have a really good time um, and just, you know, you know, illness is solved, no one has to work again, we can just spend all of our life, you know, playing video games and going to the theatre, um, you know, spending time with family, drinking beer. Um, it, no one wants to say it makes no difference one or the other, but explaining why is hard. Ben. Um, maybe an unfair question, but if you could briefly sum up what your PhD is on, what would be the, the Catholic response to long-termist? So, th so th the really quick one is, um, going back to what I was saying about overcoming that gap between what's naturally available to us as the family, the tribe, and the universality that's asked of us um, by our moral ideals. Um, that's essentially the core of the gospel. You know, seeing everyone as your brother and sister by a shared paternity of God, essentially that. And then, um, and that's kind of the challenge of the gospel, to see everyone as if they were sort of your close family. Um, so it's, it's a very, actually in many ways then becomes a really unsatisfying answer because it's like, oh, you know, this, the, the magic reasoning, you know, God has just told us to solve one of these big problems that we have. Um, um, but the, the deeper point is, um, understanding yourself as a part of the huge intergenerational project that humanity is. Um, you know, we are not as individuals saved. Um, you know, salvation doesn't just affect one of us, humanity is saved. Um, and then you can start to spin out some things there about how, you know, how do we really understand ourselves as people, um, as and the, the concept of, you know, going all the way back to sort of the Israeli concept of the people of God. Um, and seeing yourselves again as a part of this larger family, which of course, since the New Testament revelation, you know, basically, you know, the door's open, you know, everyone can be a part of that. So, um, yeah, so that, that's a quick response. I mean, I, I could give another, well, I could give another course about sort of the Catholic response, but I won't. Uh, so, yeah, but that's kind of the direction that we're going in. Um, um, yeah. uh, do you see a future situation where it might be sort of totally reasonable to not care about say a sort of climate change reached a tipping point yeah. where we know there was no going back, would it yeah. then sort of, would it be okay to give up yeah. then? Well, the really interesting thing is, is that that kind of a possibility then really um, exposes to us what's valuable. I love the thought experiment, you know, if we discovered that, you know, there was an asteroid that was going to hit the planet in a week's time, there's nothing we can do about it because we've discovered it too late. Um, what would you do in that week? You know, it's worth what I was thinking about, you know, what, what would I do? Um, would I... Um, like really, I'll probably just go see my family. Actually, just drive back to, back to Cambridge, um, and uh, yeah, and, you know, spend some time with them. Um, some people would take a more nihilistic view of things and just just go and just drink three bottles of vodka. Um, um, but that sort of situation then exposes us to that to what matters. And there's a non-trivial association there between the idea of our assumption that humanity is going to survive at least for some time into the future and directing the things that we do. So one of the, the best arguments that I've come across, and actually what I've realized is I've admitted in this talk is some of the best secular philosophy that I'm aware of um, that tries to give an answer. Um, and one of the more interesting ideas is this idea that most of the things that we do today that have value, that we perceive to be really, really important, presume that humanity has at least some kind of a future ahead of it. You know, because if an asteroid was gonna come, if climate change was just unsolvable, and you know, we're all gonna just die out soon. 
like we'd stop curating museums, we'd stop building nice buildings, um, we'd stop studying medicine, we'd stop sort of trying to develop further sort of our technological capacity. So much of what we do draws meaning from the assumption that humanity is going to survive. And so that can at least draw light um, onto the assumption, on the intuition, that actually we do care about humanity. Because in many ways, that's sort of what you're left with doing. You're like, okay, well, it's difficult for me to explain why, but let me show you all these ways for which you actually already do care that humanity matters, but you just haven't quite realized it yet. So the other one is reciprocity. So um, the fact that we, those of you that are gonna to come to mass on Sunday, I'm sorry, you're getting an anticipation of my homily. Um, the idea that we've benefited from, uh, from the past, you know, on, on every level, the fact that we have the technology to do things like that, you know, that I have a language with which to speak, that I'm wearing glasses, um, basically almost every facet of my life, um, for it to have the quality that it does at the moment is dependent on that sort of almost infinite chain of just human collaborative effort over the time. And when I grow an appreciation of that, just what seems to be a fairly consistent human response to that sensation of reciprocity, oh, oh sorry, of dependence on others, is to want to reciprocate that. Okay, well, in that case, I need to play my part to pass things on to the people that are going to come after me. You know, we, it's so naive to assume that it was for my benefit and for this generation's benefit only um, that everyone up to this stage has worked really, really hard to develop stuff. Um, and actually, when you think about it that way, actually, that's, you know, no one would want to argue for that position. And actually, it's up to us to decide um, who it was that past generations were working really hard for. Well, no, the, the natural human response, just injustice to that is, okay, well, I've got a role to play too, to you know, try to build up humanity as much as I can in the future to come. That's a very noble pursuit. Um, so yeah, that, 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 um, I, I very much went off topic, but uh, hopefully I said some interesting things in response to your question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.